Welcome to Divergent Paths with Dan Dunford. I'm Dan Dunford. Um, and Happy New Year. Welcome to 2016. Um, it's uh, worked out really nicely to have a milestone episode uh, to start the new year. But yeah, this is episode 20. I've been doing this for almost, I don't know, for five months now, basically. Which is kind of weird to think about. It doesn't seem like it's been that long. I've just been kind of going at it, and this has been great. Um, I'm really thankful for all the people who have consented to talk to me and have been so generous with their time and their and and the things that they're doing and their their experience. Uh, it it's really it's really heartwarming, I guess. <laughs> um, and I, I'm very thankful for everyone who's been on the podcast and will be on the podcast. Uh, you know, I've got stuff lined up through the end of February, so that's, um, you know, it's not going to stop. <laughs> it's just going to keep on trucking. And I'm regretting saying that phrase, but it's too late. Um, this week is, for episode 20, is the wonderful harp duo, Duo Scorpio. Um, they're really great. Um, the duo is made up of Christy Shade and Katie Andrews who are both delightful people, um, both freelance harp players, harpists, excuse me, here in the city. Um, you know, they teach and they play and then do a lot of stuff and, you know, do a Scorpio is part of what they do. Um, we got into a lot of really interesting stuff. Uh, the harp world is, is a little bit different than a lot of the communities, you know, other musical communities. So it, I was really happy to, uh, sit down with them and talk talk about that, uh, and, um, it was really good. Uh, they, they do a lot of new music commissioning, which is always interesting to me, um, expanding on what is possible and what is, what is acceptable, I guess, is, you know, for, for their instrument. So, um, I hope you enjoy their interview. Um, I have two selections of theirs, uh, on the on the episode today, um, right after, right before the interview, will be a selection from uh, Nico Muley's "Fast Dances," uh, and that's they commissioned that. And at the end, will be a selection from the third movement of a piece by Andy Akiho, which they also commissioned, entitled Two Bridges." Um, both of these pieces will be on uh, their next album, which will be coming out in fall of 2016. If you like what you hear, they do have another album uh, called Scorpion Tales. It's available on iTunes and Spotify, and it's really good, so check that out. Um, they're really they're really nice people. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed talking to them, had a good time. It's a nice early, <laughs> nice early interview. <laughs> 9.30 in the morning, we did it. It was great. Uh, <laughs> so, um, enjoy that. Also, um, if you enjoy the the podcast, you know, I, I kind of say something similar to this every week, but um, I'm really, you know, I, I'm really proud of what I'm doing here, you know, and, and I think it's good, and I want more people to hear it. That's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you like the podcast, if you like anything about the podcast, I encourage you to share it. Um, subscribe to it on iTunes or Stitcher, um, iTunes for Apple and then Stitcher for Android. And yeah, um, leave reviews, uh, on either of those, f uh, platforms. That's really helpful for me. I'd love to hear some feedback. Um, or you could email me at divergentpathspod at gmail.com, um, or hit me up on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash divergentpathspod or on Twitter, at Divergent Pod, any of those things, um, let me know what you think, um, or just say hey. Um, so yeah, you know, share it with your friends. That's word of mouth is such a huge thing with podcasts sometimes. So you know, I know some people have been doing that, and it's been I'm thankful for those people. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, um, 
do any or all of those things and uh, enjoy my talk with Duo Scorpio. Does that happen to you guys? No, it's just me. Okay. Uh, you have to get to the part that makes you cry. Yeah, you can't yeah, no, just I go just, to I bed. I just want to watch beginning. this movie. I'm in the mood. So, did too. you watch The Notebook last night? <laughs> I hate The Notebook. Those old people are the only thing that makes it worth watching. The rest of the story is oh garbage. God. But that's yeah. what's so sad. I can't watch those old people. Every yeah. time I hear that song, I'll be seen. I know. Oh my God, it loses. I love that song. But, I know, but I can't hear it anymore. Well, I just I, it, it, that movie uh, upsets me because the girl is just a horrible person. Yeah. <laughs> like I want to like her. No, I was watching a different Rachel McAdams movie actually. <laughs> Which one? It's called About Time. Oh my God. Exactly. Do you've seen it? Have you I seen it yet? It's so, so good. I love that movie and I think about it all the time. Right, exactly. And I, think and I, I thought it was just going to be that. some stupid notebook no. movie, but no, it's the, the so real, good. I think the best the best part of that movie for me is the relationship, the father-son the relationship. Father son, it's yeah. so great. I was like, yeah. Dad, Which one is it? When the, <coughs> the, the like the that, lanky yeah. sort of redhead guy is the dumb, main character. Dumb, no, oh yeah, 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 yeah. At the end, when the dad tells him to like live every day twice. <gasps> oh my god. Exactly. <laughs> See, now you, now you understand. I know. My, my, That's my, my when I have this spot. Go in the closet. Love, yeah, go the closet. closet. Yeah, I've seen and, the, and the soundtrack <laughs> is perfect. I mean, it's just like so Ben Folds and Amy Winehouse. Oh my god. And the Cure. Just love it. So now you understand why I couldn't go to bed. Is <laughs> it on TV? No, 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 I just watched it on oh. the computer. I wish it was, you know, TV, what's that? I don't have time for that. Uh-huh. Oh, I love it. Mm. All right. So, <laughs> now that we got that out of the way. Yeah, don't um, put that in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, Duo Scorpio. I need voice sample. <laughs> Christy, Katie. Christy, Katie. Awesome. <laughs> She's the one that sounds like Jersey. She's Aww. the one that sounds like Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> I'm really confused about what just happened there, but okay. Uh, <laughs> um, you both play harp. There are two harps currently. There's s- one sitting beside me. One so not here right now. There's there should be another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, did did you just you know is it is it off at summer camp or, or day camp or something or did <laughs> an electrician took a chunk out of it in my old apartment and I had to go ship get shipped to Italy to get repaired and it's been there since June. That's not. And I'm okay. getting it back on Saturday. That's so not okay. <laughs> it's not okay. <laughs> That's, It'll be back in time for December Madness though. So, as a brass player, I you know when I think of of ensembles. Um, you know, I, there's there's some brass quintet is like linchpin of, of chamber playing, and, and you you got your string quartets, and you've got your woodwind quintets, et cetera, et cetera, like all these things that literally thousands of composers have written for. Mm-hmm. In the case of string quartets, you know, good stuff, and in the case of brass quintets, hundreds of composers and very little good stuff. But mm-hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I, I I never really personally that is. I never really thought much about the concept of harp ensembles. Um, <laughs> it just seems like a lot of logistical nightmares. Not, yeah, nightmares. Yeah. Nightmares. I, it know, is. <laughs> um, even you know, with even with just two harps, and and I didn't you know harp quartets. What harp? Yeah. You know, large harp ensembles it just seems like a lot of a lot of work, and that that there wouldn't be that much. You know, there'd be a lot of work just finding music. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that sort of thing. So why 
you know, I, I know you guys do a lot, you know, you, you guys commission a lot of new music, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> uh, by a lot of great composers, but yeah. like, why, <laughs> why, harp why, duo? why a harp duo? I mean, I, uh, you know, 47 strings wasn't enough. You had to do 94. Like, <laughs> what's, what's going on? Like, what? Well, I think, you know, we both grew up doing some sort of harp ensemble. I think any harpist does, whether it's a duo, a trio, or a really large ensemble, because a lot of orchestral music doesn't have harp parts. Mm -hmm. so that's sort of like one way that we got ensemble experience growing up. Um, so harpists are kind of used to playing in that setting a little bit, but... Um, we got really interested in the duo um, and then realized that, you know, there's really not that much music. And a lot of what people play are arrangements, whether it's arrangements of, you know, Mother Goose Suite and, and um, Debbie C. Claire de Lune, which is all beautiful. But we were really interested in music that was actually written for two harps. And there's not much. Like no. you said, there's not much. Um, so that's kind of where the commissioning part came in. Yeah, that's, I mean, I primarily, I play trombone, but I primarily play bass trombone. Mm -hmm. um, and the, even, like, of course, that's that's heavy in orchestral music, but that's not even the the current modern instrument that I play. It's not what they was were written for. It was, like, mm -hmm. some other thing that was weird. And as far as, like, solo music goes, like, nothing until, like, 1960. And even then, it's, like, this is going to sound bad but like 80 percent of it is just like <laughs> meh and you yeah. end up playing it because that's what there is yeah um so i kind of get it mm -hmm. um <laughs> i kind of understand it on a personal level but you know uh, why yeah you know, no, 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 that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> we ask ourselves that well, well I mean, when you're when it's raining and you're you're trying to load things up into a car. Yeah, well, yeah. I bet you're asking. <laughs> Neither of us really pursued the solo route. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to it, it's really fun to play with another person. And we're both in other ensembles. And mm -hmm. why not two harps? It kind of, it opens up a lot of possibilities for composers. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of showcases the harp in a way that hasn't really been done before. And people really, you know, they comment at concerts, like, it's so nice to hear two harps, just just the harp. Because um, unless you're listening to a solo harp, there's always other instruments involved mm. and, and they'll say things like, oh, I've never seen two harps before, except an orchestra. And then they're, they're kind of buried maybe every now and then featured. But just to have the spotlight on the two harps and what the two harps can do together, I think people really enjoy it and are amazed at the different sounds that the harp can actually get. And I think um, from a, the composer's perspective, we open up a whole different realm of possibilities with two harps because of the limitations of the pedals with mm -hmm. one harp. Right. So just as equally as we're excited for to get pieces from them, they're excited that they now can do chromatic things that they couldn't do for solo harp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Plus, it's just really fun to play with another harp. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about this all the time. I mean, we, I mean, we love playing. We both, you know, have a flute viola harp trio as well. But when you're playing with another harpist, there's something about... I'm sure you experienced the same thing with, with Brett. Well, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, you guys sit in a section a lot. We don't always get to sit in a section. Um, but when you're playing with another harpist or somebody that plays your instrument, they just get it. You, mm. you do things the same. You phrase the same way. You're going to react to things the same way. And that's what we experience when we play. And it's just, it's really fun. Um, not the heart moving part, but, <laughs> but once we're there, it's awesome. <laughs> I feel like, uh, I, you know, there's so much about like when you're, when you're doing, when you're on gigs, like you're, you're hanging out with people and you, you, you know, I like, it's part of the reason I started the show is cause like, you don't, when you're at a gig, like you spend 10 minutes, mm -hmm. maybe five to 10 minutes, mm -hmm. like being like, Hey, what are you doing? We're on a break right now. Yeah. And then like, you, you never, you don't see them for another three months, mm -hmm. but when, when it comes to heart players, you know, you don't really have that opportunity because anytime there's a break, they're spending 15 minutes tuning. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's kind of like, well, like, you know, like I, I, I had no idea like about all this stuff that's involved yeah. um, and, and listening to your music and, and, and things by, you know, more recent um, heart composers uh, like Carolyn Lasati, mm -hmm. um, like I, I was just like, what, what is going on here? Yeah. And I've listened to a bunch of, of her stuff. Um, of course, she recorded one of her pieces. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, I would, I would, uh, from a, from a listener standpoint, I'd have to agree with that because it's, it's really, it's really exciting and, mm-hmm. and, and interesting that the different kind of stuff you can do, even with the, the, <laughs> what you might say is the disadvantages of having to spend so much time tuning it, but you can yeah. also do stuff with that because you can do weird things on every it. single string. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so less about the, why the duo, but like about your specific mm-hmm. duo. Um, so the, the name comes from the fact that you guys are partially from the fact that you guys were both born on the same day. Mm-hmm. Same year. In the same year. Yeah. November 5th. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was researching on the Are we still over. saying the year? Mm-hmm. We're, we're deciding if we're going to keep saying the year <laughs> as we continue to get older. But. Well, I mean, as the, decades, as the yeah. decades move on, you can still get away with saying 1982. But okay. in like 10 years, yeah. you might, you'll be like, mm, Done. not feeling it. <laughs> Unless we look really good for our age. <laughs> we'll see. To, 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 to be decided. Um, yeah, the name 100% came from that. Um, we, and, had, we had started played together before and kind of you know talked about wanting to form a duo and really mm. explore the repertoire and then we were out one night and realized the thing about our birthdays and it was just I mean what are the chances you know two harpists growing up I, I was born in Minnesota mm. Katie was born in New Jersey we both end up here the birthday thing is just a cool coincidence mm. and, and we just and we of, knew each other for years before we found out about the birthday thing yeah so, I mean, you were, so what, let's do a little bit of like an individual mm-hmm. spotlight, if you will. <laughs> so you're from Minnesota mm-hmm. or were born in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you end up in New York, in New York being half of this? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I was born in Minnesota. Uh, rather, let me, let me rephrase that. Christy, how did you? <laughs> Christy, <yeah. laughs> um, I was born in Minnesota where I started the harp at a very young age. I did Suzuki method at age two and a half, which there's, is, there's Suzuki there for is harp? Suzuki for harp. That. And I, um, I studied with a teacher in Minnesota and also did, um, the summer workshops where I studied with Mary Kay Waddington, who actually started the Suzuki for harp, ah, okay. um, program. So, um, I lived there till I was 11, at which point I moved to Georgia, lived there till I was 18, did my undergrad in Miami, and moved to New York for my master's. I knew I wanted to live in New York, mm-hmm. and I really um, thought that the best way to, to get into a city and get to know people was to, to go to school there. So I went to Manhattan School for my master's, which is kind of how I ended up meeting Katie. And Well, I grew up in New Jersey, and... My parents uh, signed me up for piano lessons at age six, and it just was sort of coincidence that my piano teacher was an Irish harpist and singer from Ireland, and there were harps all over the place. And after lessons, I used to go over and try them, and I was like, Mom, Dad, I want to play the harp. (laughs) And they said, I don't think so. We're not buying you a harp. (laughs) Uh, And then eventually I wore, I guess I wore them down and (laughs) I started, I started on the Celtic harp and moved on quickly to the pedal harp and then um, went to University of Delaware for undergrad, did my undergrad down there. And then same thing. I wanted to come up to New York to do my master's, went to Manus and then Manhattan School of Music. And I was at Manus while Christy was at Manhattan and then and obviously getting much better education because Manus is, is the best. <laughs> They're, can, yeah, can, Manus can, is can great. Can you tell I graduated from Manus? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just <laughs> sure, little okay. plug. Well, well, I mean, even though you they have lunch. anyway, um, <laughs> different different story. But because even though you're going to go to the different schools, you're studying with the same teacher, Susan mm-hmm. Giles, teaches yes. at both those schools. Right. So I mean, there's Obviously, in addition to everything else, there's that shared thing. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned earlier, like um, obviously you have different different paths, but like once you get to a certain point, studying with the same teacher definitely feeds into the idea of like thinking the same way mm-hmm. about approaching the harp. Right, yeah. Susan has taught so many great harpists yeah. over the years, and and really has, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So that's that's uh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, and also I think her um, Susan herself really inspired both of us. Um, you know, she's she's basically had a freelance career her whole life mm-hmm. um, and has done just some of the most 
incredible things. She's premiered so many pieces, you know, George Crumb and, and people, you know, sometimes don't realize just how much she's done and it's really inspiring to us. And so I think, you know, studying with her and, and getting really close with her. Um, and she's also just normal. She yeah. has a life. She does things other than play the harp, even mm. though she's playing the harp pretty much all the time, every day and teaching. And she has a crazy schedule, but she also is she's very close to her family. She goes traveling all over the world. I mean, she has, she's the whole package. And it's pretty impressive for yeah. an 80 year old lady. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Almost 80. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. She's not going to hear that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually met her for the first time, uh, yeah, Manis just moved down, uh -huh. moved downtown, and yeah. um, I was one of the project managers on the move. Uh -huh. And part of that was giving tours of the new building to the entire, like, well, not entire, but like all of the returning faculty and students yeah. that wanted to like see the building before classes started. And um, she came down for you know <laughs> for, for one for of the tour. tours. Not so happy with the new setup, and I'm she sure. made herself known. <laughs> Love her. <laughs> I was just like, I, I'm really sorry. I really want to help you, but I, oh. and I believe me, I, I get at least at this point, <laughs> at least yeah. now, I yeah. get it. I understand why you're upset, but I can't do anything about yeah. it. Oh. I'm just trying to show you. Things. Do they put the harps on the top floor again? That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Always. And always. There's well, not a dedicated harp practice room. Oh. Well, when I went. When I first got to Manus, there was a closet on the on I'm the top floor. Very familiar with that closet. <laughs> it's a different, not the one probably that you saw, the one off of the um, the little lounge on the. Oh, that one. It was a photocopy. A there was two photocopy machines and a bunch of file <laughs> cabinets and a harp, and people would have to come in there and do the photocopies while you were practicing. And then they moved you to that other closet, but that was like the big upgrade because there was a piano and two harps in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is how it was explained to me. <laughs> Juilliard has a $1 billion endowment. Eastman, places like that, mm -hmm. $250 million endowment. Manus's is eight. So there's only so much that they can do, apparently. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, who gives a fuck about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Arms. <laughs> what, really, what it comes down to is you guys got to stop being so needy. Um, <laughs> No, we need places to store extra strings, whatever. They should just have harps everywhere we go, and then we wouldn't have to complain about yeah, it. Yeah, we need to ever, ever move. There's pianos everywhere, piano players. Yeah, and, and, those, and those pianos get beat up. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> this is true. Anyway, so um, you guys ended up, both ended up at MSM eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I remember correctly, you guys you guys started you know collaborating in two thousand ten. Mm -hmm. um, how did you know how did that? You know, obviously, you said you guys have known each other for a long time, mm -hmm. or at least for some for a, for a period of time. Yeah. Um, like, um, what exactly was it that you know you ended up sitting down and being like, okay, we're doing this. It was a bottle of wine. Probably. <laughs> well, that sounds like a great way to start anything, really. Anything. Well, specifically, we were asked to play um, for a concert for the local chapter of the Harp Society. They wanted us to play a duo. Um, so we played, I think, Fandango, the Baccarini mm -hmm. Fandango, which is an arrangement. Um, and I think at that point, we just, you know, it's fun to play. It's pretty, but it just wasn't our passion. And we just really started you know, looking into what else is out there. Um, what was really cool at the time is that every harpist in town that we mentioned it to one wanted to help. I remember Deborah Hoffman was like, come over, dig through all my music. I went and she had this cabinet with drawers and drawers and I just went through and found anything that she had lying around. And then composers would email other composers and like people were just helping us dig up this yeah. music so that we have something to play because there really is not... Right. I mean, there's stuff, there's stuff out there and, you know, every harpist kind of knew, oh yeah, there's harp duos, but I don't think anybody really took it seriously or, you know, just hadn't really brought, been brought into the modern sort of classical music world. It was and more of the fluff. Fluffy, <laughs> what people think of harp music and that's, <laughs> yeah, glissando, oh, glissando. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we we wanted it. We wanted stuff that th people said, "Oh, I didn't know the harp could do that," mm -hmm. and that they could take seriously. 
Um, that's why, I mean, that's sort of why we've commissioned the people that we've commissioned, uh, kind of merging this harp world and just the classical contemporary world in general and getting real, relevant, up-to-date composers writing music for this. So it's not just harpists that are taking it seriously, hopefully. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's the <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, so, I mean, part of, part of like starting a group like this or any group really, um, you, you obviously have the musical and the artistic and the, oh, let's, let's come, you know, but what, you know, what kind of challenges do you face? Like as like duo Scorpio, the business, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, that's a, that's the thing that's, I would, I think personally, that's the thing that's the hardest. Absolutely. And that's the thing that we have, that musicians have the least training to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I mean, if, there's so much to think about, like a, a brass quintet. Yeah, we all just carry our instruments on our back. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much, like I, like I mentioned earlier, there's all this logistical stuff. And, oh, no, we have to have these specific things. Mm -hmm. If it's uh, if it's outside and it's raining, we're not going to play. Yeah. Sorry, if it's below whatever, we mm -hmm. physically can't play. Or we have to be able to roll our things up, yeah. you know. Like, what, what kind of things are you do, do you deal with on that end? Or I even mean, just booking stuff. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of logistical things with physically moving a harp, which I think we deal with with everything we do. Right. So that's maybe less of an issue. But, I mean, I think the biggest thing is we're not only the musicians in the group, we're the, the you know, promoters, the bookers, we do our website, um, we're doing everything. So when we meet to rehearse, you know, maybe two hours is spent with business stuff. And then three hours rehearsing music. And um, so it's it's intense. It's really good that we like each other. That, that really helps. <laughs> and we're also just, I mean, our, our work ethic is very similar. We, we work, both work very, very hard. And um, and that, yeah, that really helps. But there's, there's constant emails, like I said, with, you know, publicity, concert bookings. But also we do our own grant writing, commissioning things like in things like that. So it's, it's definitely constant work, but it's what we love and, mm -hmm. and, and it's exciting to us. And so it's work, but doesn't, but try to make me feel better on this. Okay. There are, there are mornings <laughs> where you wake up and your email inbox is oh. full of like 25, 30, oh, yeah. 40 emails. And you're just like, no, yeah. don't go away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. All the time. And every day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's every day. Great. Yeah. Take that, concert bookers. <laughs> um, just, I mean, even just little silly things, mm -hmm. you know. It, when are we, <laughs> our first album, like, I don't even know how many thousands of emails went back and forth, just even on the, the layout. Yeah, the layout <laughs> of the the design of the jacket cover. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much that goes into everything, but... Um, Somehow, I don't know if you just kind of block it out afterwards. You forget how much work it was, but. Um. Well, I, I, rem, I, I imagine that if it's with something that you really love, that mm -hmm. like you'll deal with a bunch of shit. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly it. Because I mean, we we both have a lot of other things going on in addition to the doing. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's the thing. Like you guys, like you guys, each have your own freelance careers mm -hmm. that you right. And, and I'm, I imagine teaching as well. Like all of this stuff. And this is, well, it's not. I wouldn't say it's a small part of. It, it's still just only a part of right. of each of you as a musician. And yeah. I think that that's something that you just. I mean, musicians learn as you're going along too, and you get, it's part of your routine. You are your own business. You have to wake up and you have to do those emails and people are calling you at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday. And it's just, it's just what we do because <laughs> we love doing right? I mean, we love doing it. Yeah. And we both, you know, in our, in our other, other musical life, we do pretty much the exact same thing too. <laughs> so we really understand each other, which helps yeah. and 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 it never ends and it never <laughs> ends i don't think that anyone totally understands what you do unless they do the exact same thing you do like i'm sure you feel like that with bass trombone players they're the only people who get all the little tiny things that happen on a daily basis in your life yeah and so like that's sort of comforting <laughs> yeah having a harp duo knowing that she feels the exact same way like i feel crazy all the time well, somebody else does too so it's fine <laughs> but do you guys fight over gigs 
Never. No. Never? That's nice. No. And we recommend each other for gigs. And well, if, if someone's that's... getting a gig that's not me, I want it to be her. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we like I said, we do like each other. That's, I'm not. I mean, that, that was we, a joke. You know, we're, no, 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 I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we're, you know, supportive of each other and, um, and of other harpists too. It's mm-hmm. not like, you know, <laughs> it's, only, it's <laughs> only us. There's, you know? enough, there's I mean, enough harp work in this town to go around. Yeah. I it's know. not, it's not it's, like, it's not like we're fighting each other for these gigs. Yeah. Like there's just enough. If you want to work, you can work. And even, I mean, even with the commission that we do, like mm. it, it really is for the harp community. Yeah. Hopefully they like what, what is being created as well. And hopefully they will play it. Um, that's really right. the idea. You know? yeah, so let's, let's shift and talk mm. about some of this, this new music business um i don't know it's it's early it's early <laughs> sorry <laughs> um no it's totally fine um so you've you guys have commissioned a lot of new stuff um and have been awarded a number of grants um in order to commission uh composers that maybe. <laughs> Your, your lay musician, if you will, would not necessarily have access to mm-hmm. without a larger amount of money. Yeah. Um, how did you, <laughs> you, know, you, you talked a little bit about like why you wanted to start commissioning music, but like when and how did you like really just start doing it? Like who were you in contact with and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff? Well, like we were saying, we we explored and found everything that existed and we Mm -hmm. picked what we liked and we put aside what we didn't like and then knew we had to commission. And we started sort of scouting out composers and we we were trying to come up with who we wanted to commission and who would, what we were saying about bridging this contemporary classical harp world collaboration together. And um, we went to a concert together for the harp society and heard a violin and harp piece by Robert Patterson. And it was one of those things that we both just knew that his harp writing really fit in the harpist hands. And we liked the sound of it. And I think we were sort of nudging each other during the concert, like that's who we want to write a piece for us. And we approached him and then, then realized that we needed to raise money and got, that's how we even found out about, writing grants and I mean it sort of happened that way we found the composer talked to him Mm -hmm. and then worried about the money and everything afterwards (laughs) and figured it out and then he was like I cost all of the money yeah yeah (laughs) pretty much I don't seem really nice yeah uh, (laughs) I don't think we realized how much it costs to commission music until that moment I don't think anybody does I mean now now we know but it's it's crazy. I mean, obviously well deserved, and that's how they make their living. But it—that's the hard thing is to to have all of these pieces come together so that this dream of this piece from every different composer we want to work with can actually happen. Yeah, that's <laughs> when you know, when you, like, when you're like starting out and coming out of school. Like at that point, yeah, like composers will pay you to play yeah. their music. But yeah. at a certain point, it switches, and you're like, oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just all changing. But with Rob, we we really looked out. He's an amazing composer. Like Katie said, you know, the minute we heard his piece, um, you could tell that the way he writes for the harp is is really good. And that's not true of every composer. No offense, composers. Well, but it's, it's, mean, a, it's a weird instrument. We get it. You know, it's... I mean, it's... Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. not... It's... Uh, <laughs> I've heard so many complaints about bad harp writing. Yeah. You play in student composer readings or mm-hmm. you, you, you talk to people and it's just... It's just a hard thing to write for because, right. you know, you can go into an art, like you pull out the old what, Sam Adler orchestration mm-hmm. book and, and be like, okay, this is how you write for flute. This mm-hmm. is how you write for trombone. This is <coughs> basically how it goes. But harp, there's just so many moving, moving mm-hmm. things. So like, well, mm-hmm. you know, you might not necessarily know that, yeah, they're, they're not, they're not going to want to play with their pinkies. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Or you can't force them to do four pedal changes in between eighth notes like yeah. it's mm-hmm. it's it's a pain it's a pain in the butt um so now um robert patterson robert patterson yeah. and he and he wrote <clears throat> scorpion tales which is the center kind of the centerpiece of your album mm-hmm. um scorpion tales mm-hmm. yeah. yes 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 yep, that's yes it. <laughs> go me uh yes. <laughs> <laughs> doing my job <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you know, I've I've listened to it because 
well, yeah, of course I'm going to listen to it. It's really cool. Um, so what, uh, so yeah, like, because, because it's a hard instrument to write for when, you know, even though this guy, you had seen him, you knew it, you know, you, you already were like, oh, great. He, mm-hmm. he can do it. Um, but even in a situation like that, when you're working with a composer of whatever level of, of, of heartbreaking proficiency, like how, how does, you know, how did you work together? How do you, how do you work together with a composer to, to write for you? Or do you just kind of be like, you know how to do it, just write something? <laughs> kind of. I, I think that we pick composers that we like what they're writing mm-hmm. and don't want to give them too many limitations, but we sure tell them what we don't want and just a couple of ideas maybe and let yeah. them just kind of go with it. Yeah, I mean, their, I mean, exactly. Creativity. We don't want to, we're, we pick these composers because we're excited to see what they will create. And we feel like if we tell them too much of things we want, it's just going to turn into something that, you know, isn't maybe necessarily as um, creative as it as it could have been. Um, and like Katie was saying, we kind of pick these composers that we know can write for the harp. So it's not like we they're going to send us something that's totally unplayable <laughs> and we're going to have to start from scratch. We know right. that the... the base level is there we're going to get you know something um well written and and then we're just really curious to see what they'll come up with um obviously rob was um inspired by the idea of scorpio scorpions and so his whole piece was inspired um by that and different kinds of scorpions for each movement um and also these composers everyone that we've worked with they're very curious about writing for the harp and it seems like they all want to know everything about the harp and they've come over and worked with us and made sure that everything's idiomatic for the instrument and that if it's in our hands well and that we're happy and they're all they've all every one of them been open to making little changes here and there mm-hmm. and yeah they'll maybe send us part of the score as they're working again just to make sure everything's fitting even with nico we would get something emailed and just um yeah just double check everything is is absolutely correct. Um, I think the only thing we've ever vetoed is um, <laughs> some some really um, intense um, special effects. I mean, we like the extended techniques, but sometimes it's really nice just to play your instrument, you know, and not be hitting it and whacking it with things. And and we, as long as the extended techniques are used thoughtfully mm-hmm. um, and that they really honor the music, it's great. But I think that's the only thing we've ever really tried to steer composers away from using too much things. Um, uh, the trombone player mm-hmm. having a slide and <laughs> a lot of weird things and a large instrument, like <sighs> extended techniques. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of guys who are really into it. And I imagine there are a lot of harp players that are really into it. Yeah. But um, as far as I'm concerned, I was... <clears throat> Good compu- composers use them, like, you know, all, at least for me, Cage, Zanakis, mm-hmm. Barry, they all, um, they all like experiment with these things. And I was kind of like, was always in my personal things, like, it feels like kind of a crutch, mm-hmm. but that's just for me. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, like, come on, just play, play, the, just play, the, play instrument. the instrument. Yeah. <laughs> but, there, there are extended techniques in a lot of our pieces, though. And right. We, and they're used really well. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm saying is like a piece where it, like, it's, yeah, I think that there's some, minutes some and, composers like, who it's very gimmicky at this point. Yeah, yeah. and like, so that's in the what, '50s it was it was exploratory and, and, and now, it's, edge, been, now, it's, now like, it's kind of been done. Yeah. Sixty years later, guys. And there's on. there's so <laughs> many weird things you could do with the harp, but like you can with the wood and with the strings mm-hmm. and with the pedals. And I think that there maybe they're always kind of looking for the next new one that mm-hmm. no one's done yet. And yeah. we, I mean, there's all we've done like every single kind of crazy <laughs> yeah. thing you could possibly name. <laughs> point i think oh you can make it sound like a cat that's amazing (laughs) kind of (laughs) yeah um so yeah we try to encourage it but i mean keep it like i said thoughtful and purposeful not just random Mm -hmm. things yeah that makes sense (laughs) (laughs) so you in addition to doing you know your performance and stuff you guys also teach and do do classes as as a duo in addition to your individual things um you mentioned you were just at berkeley Mm -hmm. in in boston this past weekend um and what was that for so 
We gave a master class at Berkeley for mm -hmm. Felice Pomeranz, who's the harp teacher up there. And we did a little bit of a workshop on exactly what we're talking about, what, how we got started and did our commissions, how we had a life after oh, school. So you've got all this stuff already locked <laughs> and loaded. All I have to do is show up and start recording. She just <laughs> come to the clinic. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a few days ago. But... We we also listened to several of their students play for us, mm -hmm. and Berkeley is such a cool place. We had no idea they they are open to anything. So we right. had a singer songwriter play and sing. We had a jazz uh, a classical harpist, but who also improvises and does jazz. Just sit down and do one of the most amazing jazz mm -hmm. harp pieces I've ever heard and um, a composer who also plays. I mean, they just were like all over the board. It wasn't just this strict classical only play. Yeah. I think the idea was that we were there to inspire them and, and show them that there are things, you know, you can make a career as a harpist, not necessarily doing the things that um, were sort of drilled into your mind at a young age, that if you don't win a competition, if you don't win an orchestra job, you're nobody. Um, and th those things are great for the people that do do those. But uh, like Katie said, we never really wanted a solo touring career um you never wanted to win an orchestra job so you could sit out during beethoven <laughs> <laughs> the fifteen thousand Beethoven. actually i mean i went i did the orchestral performance program at manhattan school thinking that that's what i wanted to do oh, okay yeah and then i realized that i really like doing all this other stuff yeah i mean so i mean quick like you you mentioned already that you've already mentioned a couple times oh it didn't didn't do really the solo thing didn't mm -hmm. want to do why not because it's fun doing all these different things. We and do everything. Play we play orchestra, people. opera, jazz, pop. We do the duo. I mean, mm -hmm. we just do a little bit of everything. And it's not for everyone. I think that a lot of people want a secure job. And that makes a lot of sense, too. It's just we figured this other way out, and it's working for us. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's like we didn't want to be soloists and we didn't want to do this. It just it sort of all our life was guided this way because of what we were doing and we just really like where we're at right now. I don't think it was choosing to do one thing rather than the other, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. And we still do do solo um, we, things, yeah. maybe not a full solo recital, but we'll do concertos and, you know, things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think to us, it's more fun having the eclectic lifestyle as opposed to just being a soloist and going touring all over the country by yourself. I guess that's more of what we're trying to say. A lot of, a lot of lonely <laughs> hotel rooms. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. It's fun. It's, it's fun, fun to play doing with this. Another mm. person. But yeah, so at Berkeley, I mean, we were, I think the idea was that we were there to inspire them, but they really inspired us. I mean, it's so, it was just so great to see all these different things that harpists are doing. And that's really you know, kind of the future of music and it's, it's, they're, they're on the right path. It's, mm -hmm. it's really great to see because doing different things, doing new things, exciting things. It's, um, it's awesome. So yeah. when do you, do you feel like that has changed just even since you all finished your 14 degrees or, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> kind or, of, I mean, or is it like, you know, uh, I guess, do you feel like you were kind of in the first wave, uh, some of the first wave of harp players to like realize that this is like the way things are going now or, or is it just kind of how it worked out? I'm, I'm guessing that's, <laughs> I think it's been a progression that's been happening probably mm -hmm. since we've, since before, since we were in school, we probably didn't even realize that it mm -hmm. was happening. And now if you look around and see all the orchestras that are losing funding and people who have these amazing jobs who are worried. And I don't, I think that it's been happening over yeah, probably more than the past 10 years, but I think we are kind of on that wave of people who are sort of pointing the other way, like Manus moved down and now is is not just this little strict classical conservatory. They're going in all these other directions and collaborating yeah. with the opera department and mm, the, the, the Tisch design. The, yeah, uh, I mean. Tisch is, is in way. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, what's the? Parsons. What's, Parsons, Parsons yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people are realizing you can't just sit at home and wait for the New York Phil to call you. There's really, you know, you kind of have to go out and make your own opportunities, especially when you really care about something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of jazz harpists out there. Well, not a lot, but a handful of really, really talented ones. And they've certainly paved their own way and um, created something 
that didn't exist before and and obviously they love it and it's I think the same thing for us it's just yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and um you mentioned a little bit early very briefly um about working with God, I, I'm not, I'm, I never can say his name right. Nico Muley? Muley? Muley. Muley? Muley. Muley. Great. <laughs> this, guy's a, this guy's a heavy hitter, like a real heavy hitter yeah. in as far as 21st century music goes. Um, and that, that came about through a grant from... Chamber Music America. Chamber Music mm-hmm. America. Um, and so how did, like, what, what was the process there? Same, same, same process. Thing, just like... we, we wanted him and <laughs> we asked him if he would write us a piece and then had to figure out how we'd get this fee. But, I mean, mm-hmm. he, like you said, he's a heavy hitter, so he he's expensive to commission, <laughs> but he's awesome. And we yeah. knew that it was we were going to get an amazing piece from him. Mm-hmm. We had been fans of his for a while and loved that he was sort of in a bunch of different worlds, not just the classical world. I mean, he, you know, writes music for Grizzly Bear, the band, and um, he's done movie music. Like, he's all over the map, and he's well-respected in all these different um, area, areas of music. <laughs> writes for Grizzly Bear, but then also has his opera perform by the Met. I know, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And he's, you know, our age. It just, he's, it's it's awesome. And, and that's, I mean, we kind of, you know, we're talking about wanting the harp to be more, respected in the classical world but just the world in general the Mm -hmm. pop music world everything we want people to take it seriously and and know what it is and what it can do and so we love that about nico that he kind of crossed all of these different barriers and like katie said we just knew he'd write us an amazing piece i mean if anything you know he's kind of like from what you're saying he's like basically the perfect composer to write Mm -hmm. for you guys because because of all these things that we've been talking about, like yeah. this whole like amalgamation of everything as opposed to, you know, well, I mean, let's be, let's be real. Like you can make more money if you can do more than one thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unless you get real lucky and have that really great day yeah. when you win that job. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I mean, that's not going to happen for me. Like, <laughs> it's just, yeah. you know, it's, it's, pro- well, probably not. <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, so you guys put out your last album in 2012 Mm -hmm. are you recording another one Mm -hmm. soonish we are we are we've started we've started recording we've recorded one track of the new album andy akiho's piece two bridges Mm -hmm. and then we are recording the rest of the album in february Mm -hmm. and it will be entirely of pieces we've commissioned yeah so it'll have the muley um the akiho of course uh giovanni piacentini wrote us a piece, um, Fred DeSena and Paul Patterson, who's a British composer who a lot of harpists will know. He's written um, some solo pieces that are very popular. Um, and, and Chris Dietz. Oh, and Chris Dietz also wrote us a piece. So we're really excited about it. We already recorded the Kehoe because he mm. wanted us to do actually a music video of the piece, which oh sounds boy. super cool. Right. And it was. It was. <laughs> We shot it. Um, at oh, we already location. did it. We yeah. did, yeah. So that's why we recorded the Akiho early, um, because we needed the audio for right. that for this video. So we did the video just about two weeks ago, at a twelve-hour shoot. It was really intense. But where did you guys shoot it? Um, at the the videographer's studio in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Um, so kind of some <laughs> Very different urban. No outdoors. No. <laughs> no, no, no outdoors. And a lot it of it's going to be like rain that day. Uh, it wasn't an option. <laughs> yeah, come on, just get a be- just get like, an umbrella. For, no, no, for brass players, like a lot of brass players will have a beater horn. We call it beater uh, horn that you can use like for, for yeah. parade gigs yeah. and yeah. stuff, which comprises a lot of our money. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, just get a beater harp. Yeah. Those, those are cheap, right? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's going to be cool. It was a lot of like, you know, tight shots of just our hands, hands and... and um, looking intense. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be cool. But yeah. Yeah. Andy's really into music videos. I don't know if you've seen any. Andy. Uh, Akiko. Akiko. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It but seems I mean, to be a lot of composers right now are mm-hmm. doing music videos for their stuff. Well, if you look at, the, you know, not just the classical music world, but, you know, visuals are so important these days of people watching TV. And, you know, if they can see a video of you doing something, I think it's very impactful. And also there's this thing of whole, this whole thing of consistently putting out content. Mm -hmm. Um, Like 
I've, I've had conversations about this in, in regards to social media, which I hate, but yeah. have to use and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. um, you, you end up with this thing like social media, because social media, never, Jesus, because social media never stops going. Like if you don't keep things coming up every so often, then people forget. Yeah. Or even even like well-known people, like you guys have gotten a lot of good press and have, a, have done a lot of really cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And even then, like, if it's not, if you're not consistently putting out stuff and be like, hey, I'm doing this, hey, I'm doing this, hey, I'm yeah. doing this, people just forget. And it's no really fault of their own. It's, if anything, it's a cultural issue. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's the expectation is that every, mm-hmm. you know, regularly, every yeah. few weeks, every, every, at least every month, you know, for an ensemble, even if you're not performing necessarily, like, there's got to be something, right? Yeah. You know, it's... Exhausting. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, yeah. So, what do you guys have coming up? Besides, I mean, you just, just like recording. The recording is the big thing. We we just finished, you know, a few kind of big things this month with the thing in Boston and the music video and a couple concerts, um, and now we're into December Madness mm. for Harpus, which we do have actually a lot of duo things. We have probably four concerts together. A lot of it, they want sort of holiday music, but we'll be throwing in our our pieces as well. Um, but co- <laughs> <laughs> just a shock. Do you guys have so. transcriptions of the Nutcracker? <laughs> <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, come January, it's going to be preparing for the um, the next album. We'll have two of the pieces. We'll just be receiving basically. In January, oh. so we'll have to <laughs> have to yep. learn them. Have <laughs> to learn them and rehearse, rehearse, rehearse for February recording. Mm-hmm. So, and then we also we teach at the Young Artist Harp Seminar every summer in Georgia, and once the new year hits, we're deep into planning for that. So we we two years ago started the preparatory division mm-hmm. of this existing seminar, and we do tons of work for that, and that'll start probably in right January. around yeah. Because yeah. you didn't have enough to do. Or? <laughs> <laughs> we were bored, twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> um, no, it's a great program, and mm-hmm. it, it's fun to go down to Georgia every year. We usually do a concert down there as well. But um, yeah. Wait, did you just say it's fun to go down to Georgia in the summer? Yeah. Well, we are in the North Georgia mountains, oh. where oh. it's beautiful, oh. and there's a breeze. and oh, yeah. It's so beautiful up there. <laughs> so that is a, a pleasure. To yeah. And actually, we're playing in the Harp Conference is in Atlanta this mm-hmm. summer. Oh, okay. So we'll be down we'll there. Be down there for quite a bit in Georgia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier than what last year was in what Utah or something. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> I have so much harp stuff in my head nowadays. Yep. It's, it's like You get it. It's like who you get who it. is this random trombone player who knows the, <laughs> like when we had a we had our the new harpists come in because both of the harp players at Manus graduated last year, yeah. so they have three new ones. And um, as everything was moving in, they're like, "Who is this guy who knows how to like move harps?" And <laughs> you know, and also, I my first job there when I was still a student was yeah. as a per- I was a percussion mover, but that also for concerts that involved moving the harps. Uh-huh. And I was the only guy that the orchestra manager trusted, because that was that wasn't him to move them. Chris, and Chris with, with yeah. the, the flat tire. With, oh yeah. <laughs> The the flat flat tire. Tire. <laughs> but yeah, so like, so like, I, <laughs> yeah, I so like there's these, these hard players who are like, who are you? Why do you know all this stuff about yeah. the cool. weird harp world? It's weird. <laughs> it is. But... It is weird. <laughs> I forgot about the pump. I hate that pipe. It's always flat, and then the herb's like, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and then you're like walking, like trying yeah. to force it down the hall and people are staring not at you. roll on the carpet. And they're like, how do you not know how to move a harp? But it's really hard on that dolly yeah. when you have a flat tire. Yeah. <laughs> and trying to make sure they're not, there's this little lift up into the truck and trying to make sure they're oh not falling God. off. And it's snowing and 30 degrees outside. Yep. It's, it's a good life. Yeah. Um, glad I don't, I'm pretty glad I don't do that. I'm very glad I don't do that anymore. Um, anyway, so like the last thing I wanted to hit on was just with a larger ensemble, four to five people, when it comes to like rehearsing, mm-hmm. uh, it's not that different than a large large ensemble rehearsal. Uh, you, you have a schedule, you kind of like work out your things. With two people who are really good friends, I would imagine, and like, uh, 
you're so invo- you're so back and forth mm-hmm. all the time like you're you're emailing each other you're, I just uh, I would imagine that that creates challenges when when it comes to rehearsing you're doing with a lot of your difficult music obviously you work on your stuff on your own as well but yeah. mm-hmm. um when when you're do you guys get together at least you know, how, like every week I'm assuming you'd have you'd have to but yeah um and then when we have something big coming up, a lot, <laughs> like oh yeah, five I, times a week. I, I mean, know. I see her more than my husband. Yeah. <laughs> I just, and that you know, um, <laughs> I mean that in a good way because not nothing against my husband, but you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. We're we're I, together. I don't, don't, don't spit out your coffee. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have a husband. I don't know what you mean. So. <laughs> no, we yeah we're we're together all the time, and like we talked about earlier, a lot of it is the the business stuff. Um, and then, oh yeah, we should play now. And then Mm -hmm. it's also the rehearsal, but when we're preparing for something, it's pretty intense and, and we both kind of have the same, um, rehearsal sort of mentality and we'll rehearse for hours and hours and hours and just, you know, keep going. It's Uh, with, with a large, with a slightly larger ensemble, it's Mm -hmm. it's kind of easier to deal with disagreements yeah because there's usually one or two people who run the whole thing mm-hmm. and they get the final say it's just the two of you are so you trying to like yeah i think like you're trying to start focus something here. <laughs> no, 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 i'm just curious no, no, no. i'm not trying to start anything i'm just curious for like um uh, like uh, we know what you're doing <laughs> controversy sells stuff uh, this is a free show it sells no i'm just you know like i you know, I'm not asking you to dredge up like difficulties, but like yeah. there are interpersonal challenges when it's just two people, um, you know, and it's like there's no leader. It's the two mm-hmm. of you collaborating. There is no leader and we're collaborating together and we respect each other. And at the end of the day, we just both get it done and we try to split things up so that we don't have any of these disagreements. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's weird, but we really are on the same page. I don't think we've had one fight or, I mean, yeah. big disagreement. Okay. And, yeah, I mean, it's not like we're telling somebody how to play, oh, you should play this part like this, because we both play the same, you know, it's, we're doing the same thing. And you you're know? both good at harp, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but, um, I mean, we definitely throw around ideas, mm-hmm. dynamics, phrasing, um, and we'll, you know, try things different ways. But I don't think, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, now I mean, that we say choosing, this, we're probably going to have some huge... But even <laughs> even choosing... No! To... <laughs> no! <laughs> started with Dan! <laughs> In June, it's going to be like, do you have Scorpio breaks up and irreconcilable differences? <laughs> you know, Christy Shea, former, former member, former says member. that they can, they can trace... <laughs> <laughs> the seeds of Discord back to a podcast they did in November. Oh, it's not going to happen. No. no. <laughs> we, we can't break yeah. up. No. <laughs> Nobody else has our birthday. Yeah. It wouldn't work. Possible. Possible. I think we, I mean, we do enough stuff apart in our own lives that it's not, I mean, sounding like all we do is we're right. together all the time, but that's not true either. Yeah. And we do social things with each other too, so we still have our friendship. Um, that's well, not just yeah, of course. Like, yeah, that that's a big thing. Yeah. It's like being friends with people. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think it's really just about respect. I think Katie was starting to say when we pick the parts. How did you know that? I was going to say. Yes, I know you. <laughs> we yeah. obviously spend a lot of time. Yeah, when we pick parts, we always rotate. It's never like, well, you're always first, you're always second. It's it's really it's not a thing. Yeah, and and that is actually one thing that we tell composers: we want the parts to be equal. What we never we never because sometimes with duos, you know, harp one is the leader, really? but yeah, um, huh. more in these older the right. old, old school harp yeah. duos, where it's more of like a harp solo with harp yeah. company. Exactly. <laughs> I don't think we do anything. We don't do anything like that. Well, no. Uh, I mean, all virtuosic chamber music like. Uh, like virtuosic tra- brass quintet transcriptions it's like you know the, the two trumpets yeah there's first trumpet and second trumpet yeah. but <laughs> both of them are real hard yeah yeah uh, and i would imagine that like you know because you have your own solo career it's like yeah it's, this, it's not it's it's both of you it's not one and then exactly <laughs> and then the one the other one the... so would you do you guys have a, a perspective release date for your album or is it just about making sure everything is recorded before you know Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. No. I, sorry, I thought no, you were going to say something else. I, I was thinking of something else to say, but it didn't happen. So. 
our, our plan is for fall. Um, we'll be meeting with our record company in about two weeks just mm-hmm. to finalize all of the dates. Um, we have the recording date set up and then the editing will be um, finished as well. I think the big thing is just logistics like a photo shoot and getting um, the liner and all of that design into the record label and um, they also deal with Naxos. So there's a lot of really, really hard deadlines for those things um, that need to fall into place. So we don't have our exact release yet, but we're aiming for probably September or, or October of 2016. So, All right. I yeah. think- I think that's everything. Um, do you guys have anything specific that you want to plug over for, for the next month, over the, that's coming up over the next month or so? The album, we'll be having our release at National Sawdust. Mm-hmm. And we were just there last night for a concert. It's awesome. It's in Brooklyn. Well, is do you it, know about is this that, place? Was it new? Because yes, I've seen, new. like, I, there's been, like, just I, I've had, it's like, like the 10, new place. 10 different people I know have been playing yeah. there. I'm like, what is this place? I it just have, opened. I, it's okay. amazing. Our, um, our engineer, Adam Abe's house, um, is one of the um, part owners, part owners, I think of it. And so he's been talking about this project for years with us. Um, and it's officially open now and it's mm-hmm. just amazing. The acoustics are awesome. Um, I don't think there's another venue like it. Yeah. It's very cool. Well, obviously I have to go out there now. Yes, it's really cool <laughs> and easy to get to. But yeah, so we'll be having the release there in the fall. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. Thank um, you. Really